Um, I'd like to acknowledge my uh, co-authors of this talk, and um, in particular uh, Michael Lines, who has just recently left Sardi to take a job in the private sector, but a lot of this work has been uh, Michael's research effort over the last few years. Um, so, uh, and also uh, the group carried on uh, in my absence last year, as I was fortunate enough to have a trip in to Canada for most of last year. So. I didn't actually see a lot of the uh, seasonal conditions last year, so I'm relying on good intellect, but what I did find out was that the uh, Canadians aren't particularly good at swimming, and, um, and I worked out why. But the season last year, um, pulses ended up uh, average, average yields, um, as you'd be aware, uh, due to a, a number of things, um, but that dry finish reduced yields, but um, also the cool finish enabled them um, to still get to average yields. So that, that cool finish was particularly critical uh, for finishing off yields. Um, the other thing coming out of last season is this: uh, is that lentils have now established themselves um, as a, a major, a major pulse crop in South Australia. They're equal in area to field pea at 110,000 hectares, but due to their being grown in the more favourable environments, they are obviously um, uh, producing more than field peas. So they are our number one crop. Um, they were, amazingly enough too, they were 16% of the total crop on York Peninsula last year, which is probably the highest intensity of lentils um, probably anywhere in the world, really. Um, uh, maybe parts of Canada are high, but, um, but on a whole, Canada's not that high as a percentage. Pulses were 25%, and um, a lot of that increase on the York Peninsula had been fueled by um, the uptake of the XT technology and PBA Hurricane. There was three lentil varieties and one fava bean variety released last year, and that's what I'm going to concentrate on in this talk. Um, so one of those lentil varieties was PBA Jumbo 2, a new high-yielding, disease-resistant red lentil. This is a graph of 30 comparisons of NVT trials and, and breeding trials. Uh, we have the uh, variety yield on, on, on the y-axis, and the x-axis is a site mean yield. And what we're seeing is that generally PBA Jumbo 2 is higher yielding than all the other mid-season varieties um, right across the board, but particularly as, as the yields get up, and that's due to its combination of improved plant type and uh, also its disease resistance. It is a mid-season type, so it really is sort of replacing the nugget ace type areas. Um, if you compare it with, say, one of our more earlier season types, which grows in the lower rainfall areas like uh, uh, Bolt, you can see Jumbo 2, there, there isn't a lot of data points here, but it does come down a bit, and that's not surprising. It is mid-season, and uh, oh, welcome to all the late people. Once in my life, I wasn't the last one. Um, so, uh, ju so Jumbo 2 is a bit lower yielding down at, at that end, and um, in particular, if I put the Victorian data up, it really does tail off in some of their lower uh, yielding environments. So. And that's not surprising, Bolt, with its early maturity, it's, it's probably it's, it's easier harvestability and also it's boron tolerance um, explaining that result. It is a large seeded variety too. So the other new, two new varieties in lentils were greens. So do, should we be going green in lentils? Well, a bit of background. Canada, um, as you know, is the world's major exporter, largest exporter of lentils. Um, their industry was based on greens. Last year they had 3.1 million acres, but their production was about 25% down due to widespread flooding. In recent years, they've had big swings to red lentils. So about five to 10 years ago, they hardly grew any red lentils. Their industry was founded on greens. Uh, 2013, they were 50% red. Last year, they were 65% red. There is no indication that that swing is, 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 is sort of halting up, um, particularly with these wet seasons they're having and greens not being that well suited to them. They've also got record estimates um, for sowing plantings in 2015, driven by prices. Um, so Australia, the two new varieties give us an opportunity to diversify our production and market risks um, associated with red lentils. We have a small domestic market uh, for green lentils, um, and often that is supplied by imported Canadian green lentils. There is much bigger markets internationally, but we, don't, we haven't hit them um, and we don't have a reputation into them yet. There's two new improved varieties. One is a, a large cedar replacement for Boomer, which fits on the, on the international, what they call the Laird, large green lentil market. And there's a medium sized one, PBA Greenfield. We've never grown medium sized green lentils before, and these are more aimed at North um, African and, and also European markets. The thing we've read, uh, the thing to consider with green lentils is it's all about seed quality. They're sold and they're eaten like that. 
They're not like red lentils where the husk is removed and they're split. That's how they're consumed. So it's all about having exactly like that, nice, attractive, uniform seed size um, and free of insects and disease. Seed quality paramount. They are a little bit later as a, as a, a plant, plant uh, grouping and they're also, they have higher biomass and are more prone to lodging, which leads to disease and sometimes um, uh, shading. We're suggesting experienced growers tackle greens. If you're going to get your clients growing greens, experienced lentil growers. I mentioned the markets are emerging. On-farm storage is a must until we get the markets established and, and routine like the reds, on-farm storage is, is a must. And separation from reds because they have a yellow cotyledon, the reds have a, obviously have a red cotyledon. That's really important. And we've had, those, uh, had to deal with that with PBA flash in the past. So, um, or with the seed coat colour, I mean. Um, we, how do they yield? So the greens, um, the new one, the medium size green field is high yielding right across the board and it's yielding pretty well similar to PBA Ace, a little bit below PBA Jumbo 2 but well above Nugget. So we've now got a green lentil, medium seed size but it performs like a red generally. Um, Giant is a better version than Boomer really and you can see that. Critically it's doing a lot better in the lower yielding environments. And this is really important when you're talking about something which is sold on seed size and seed appearance because it's got more chance of giving you a decent seed size in those poorer years, and which has been a problem in the past when we've tried to grow greens with unadapted varieties that when we get a poor year, we get really poor quality. That's a quick flack on their seed size. You can see giant bigger than boomer. Um, so the agronomics. We've done a lot of work on time of sowing because the farming systems are pushing um, lentils or pulses and generally all crops to early sowing for com competition with weeds um, for handling these drier seasons we're getting more and more of. Typically in pulses and, and sometimes in lentils you see things where when you sow early you don't get a benefit from sowing early. In Pinery last year you can see some of the older varieties like Boomer and Nugget you know, they don't perform well or they don't give you any benefit from sowing early and that's often because of disease, it's often because they're not uh, the plant types get too big and they fall over and collapse. What we're seeing now is some of the newer types, particularly those which stand up better, it, they, you do get, a, you get that benefit from sowing early. And PBA Jumbo 2 um, showing that. And PBA Jumbo 2 is very nicely um, performing well across both sowing dates. Okay, So whether it's sown early or sown late, it's, it's been high yielding. It's very remarkably consistent. The other thing is the two greens have also improved um, over Boomer, um, particularly the PBA Greenfield, the medium sized one, it's starting, as I said, behaving more like a red with its agronomics. Uh, we've repeated that at um, Melton and a higher biomass producing site and a similar results again, you know, Boomer struggling but um, Greenfield doing well and Jumbo 2 doing well sown early. The other, other thing I mentioned was, was a lot of this is to do with lodging. You can see varieties like Boomer and Nugget that they um, sown later that their lodging isn't as good as these other varieties. And when um, we sow them early, generally everything falls over, as we know. So, okay, early sowing has got some good things, but until we get varieties which can stand up sown early, um, sowing early we will always have this issue with lodging. But when we start to sow them later, or we don't have as much biomass produced, we start to see the genetic separation, and we've made improvements. So early sowing increases lodging, it doesn't guarantee larger seed size either. Often it's the reverse, actually. Later sowings often give us more uniform large seed size. It can also um, increase things like shattering and colour bleaching in the greens because you've got this spread of the pod formation over the plant, while when you're sowing later, you, you're condensing everything. So um, there are things to consider, particularly with the green lentils. I was asked to talk about the work we've done on the XT technology in regard to the residue tolerance to group Bs. And we've done work now for a couple of years in South Australia and Victoria, um, following on from obviously getting the um, permit for, spin for spinnaker for as an as a in-crop application to have a look at the improved tolerance to residual SUs in lentils. And what that work has shown, as you can see from this graph, that, that they, they do have improved. We used Hurricane here at Pinery in, th in 2013. They do have much improved tolerance to residuals over the um, conventional lentils. The, these shaded bars are the nil treatment with the associated error. But what we did find, and in, this, in 2013 we applied it as a post-sowing pre-emergent, we used very low rates, whoops, um, 
And what we did find was that um, so some products, we did get reduction as we increased the rates of some products in the XT technology. So they are improved, but they do still can suffer damage. We repeated that in 2014, and this time we added a residual treatment which was um, applied in March. Okay? And uh, we also did have a post zone pre-emergent. We, we only had chlorosulfurin, met metsulfurin in that trial. A similar trend, but um, less damage with the application applied in March. But again, we're still having times when we are losing um, yield to, uh, with the XT technology um, to those simulated residual carryovers of group Bs. So they are improved, but not foolproof. So there was a seasonal environmental impact. Um, the XT lentils are improved. Um, the product response um, is, it depends on the product. So there is a product response, and that some yield loss will occur in some situations, and nothing's changed on the labels. So we need to stick to um, the current labels, but we, what we need to do now is get some uh, further work done on this on plant back trials to see if we can get residuals uh, recommendations changed or plant back periods changed because I, there is opportunity to use this technology more than just as an in crop application. So we can use it in the farming system. Maybe it needs to be used as um, used in the, the preceding cereal crop and we can then um, just rely on that carry through to give us some weed control into the pulse crop. We need to explore those things. The new faba bean variety released last year, PBA Samira, it's much like the PBA Jumbo 2 story in lentils in that its yield increase generally comes over uh, the other varieties when you get into the high yielding environments. And that's because it stands up better um, and it's got better disease resistance. Um, also, perhaps it's a um, it, it starts flowering a little bit later as well. It appears to be su better suited to those higher faba bean producing areas than the other varieties. Um, in some agronomy work we've done on this, uh, this was at Tali last year, and we've seen this response over a few years now that generally, obviously, you get a decrease in faba beans as you delay sowing, but Samira was clearly the highest yielding variety at the earlier higher yielding um, treatment. And if you look at what happens to lodging at those treatments, you can see that it was increased in Farah, but didn't really increase in, well, there was no response in Samira, so it has got much better lodging resistance. And in a year like 2013, when lodging was much higher, you can see Farah really fell over. Um, PBA Samira quite, quite uh, upright. So that's a good improvement, which is probably aiding um, its adaptation to those high yielding environments. The other thing I want to talk about faba beans is uh, when you're bulking up Samira, um, it has got improved disease resistance. It's important to uh, retain varietal purity, and you'll do that by making sure you, you bulk it up at least 400 metres away from any existing faba beans. Last thing to finish on was uh, field pea, and uh, no new field pea varieties released, but I just want to alert you to something which we've, we're sort of picking up on. Casper was poor performing compared to its long-term average across all trials last year in South Australia, and this line down here, Wharton, was very much above its average. So Wharton is um, an early flowering variety. Casper obviously late, but, but matures quite rapidly. Um, that might explain a bit what else. Uh, Wharton has uh, to improved tolerance to boron. That might help. It also has improved tolerance to PC bore mosaic virus. So that's a story I want to follow up on. It has resistance to powdery mildew. That probably didn't help last year. So what's going on with PC bore mosaic virus? Well, we've have work, uh, some work that Jop van Lure from New South Wales DPI has done has shown that there's um, inf infection levels in our trials. Um, so he's, he's sampled, surveyed a number of our trials and he's found infection levels and they've been up to 18%. The industry standard for PC ball mosaic virus is 0.5%. Okay, so some of these trials, this was in Casper, which is a known susceptible line. Um, some of these levels are really high. So we need to keep an eye on, uh, eye on this, see what's going on. The other little thing which is twigging us to this is that Yarram, um, uh, which is uh, not in these trials, but Yarram also performed well in South Australia, particularly in the southeast and the mid north. And Yarram has PC ball mosaic virus resistance too, like Wharton. And um, both those uh, varieties did well um, in areas where there's a lot of um, uh, virus activity and insect uh, flights. So something to keep an eye on. The best way to clean it up is to source clean seed. And, it, and that's a pretty good strategy. If you start with low levels of virus in your seed, you, you get some life out of that. It takes a while to build it up. And in the, 
they were my take home messages. So why was switching over to Rowan? So what happened last year um, in pulses? Uh, Asuka, Kaida and both faba beans and uh, lentils uh, got going again. We've seen this in the last couple of years and a lot of it, is, of course, is driven by the frequent rain rains we get. The May-July period really establishes outbreaks. We saw it in both of these crops. Um, however, once the rain stopped in August, then uh, that disease that was in the lower level canopy really didn't get up uh, further in the canopy and, and we didn't see it on pods. So that really uh, pulled us up. However, uh, we did get good establishment of diseases and particularly the, um, I want to emphasise the fact that Ascochyta farbi has, uh, which last year I reported on a, a new virulent strain, <coughs> a shift in this uh, disease spectrum and, and it certainly has become very well established in the lower and mid-north of South Australia in those growing districts and some new evidence is that it is present in the southeast and Victoria as well. I mean that is only as far as looking for it and finding it in trials. Um, we'll just uh, continue to monitor what happens in, in commercial crops but it's a point of interest and, and of note. Chocolate spot in faba bean last year, uh, what was really concerning was that it did get established very early, er, much earlier than, than typically seen and that was driven by the warm conditions and the, uh, uh, that we experienced or the mild conditions through that May-June period uh, which was uh, really got it established. Um, we potentially could have been in for uh, a bit of a rough ride uh, with that disease if it gets that established that early, however uh, the dry and windy spring really halted development. And, uh, and sort of put a stop to that. So it was a little bit of a get out of jail there. Uh, we saw a same sort of thing with rust in faba beans. Again, it had established early, and in this case, rust, if it does establish early, it can really uh, get some long legs to um, cycle through and become a real problem. Um, it does like those warmer, mild conditions, and, uh, but it became very unfavourable in the dry conditions of spring. And, uh, and really, in the, in the case of the northern areas uh, of faba bean growing districts up in northern New South Wales, rust is a real problem because of that, uh, the fact that if it does establish early and, and just sits on a lot of uh, sort of humid stored moisture, it loves it. But we, we did get out of uh, jail there. Um, just want to talk about faba bean, the Ascochyta virulence shift. Um, as reported last year, there's been two resistant genes that have been compromised from this uh, new sort of virulent form of the disease. It's become established in the lower and uh, mid-north of South Australia, but again, uh, as um, we've identified in the southeast and Victoria. What it means is uh, that uh, uh, suscept susceptibility is now established in FARA in those areas. So FARA really is now equivalent to Fiesta, if you're uh, just to put it in a, in a perspective there. PBA RANA has been compromised uh, to a point. It is not uh, as bad. It, it tends to be less on the, the stems and, and foliage of sorts, but the, the pods are uh, susceptible, and you can see these are RANA pods here with a high level of uh, ascochyta lesioning. Uh, so really it's going to be through pod, uh, pod set you really need to protect this variety in those regions. Nura and the new PBA Samira are resistant. Uh, but as Lan has said, you, don't, you want to minimise any genetic drift that might occur if you're going to be bulking up PBA Samira. Uh, so really isolate it from existing faba bean crops uh, to, just to, to, uh, to maintain that uh, genetic purity, especially as you're bulking it up for the s subsequent seasons. Um, the, f the PBA faba bean breeding program led by Jeff Paul has uh, just got some really interesting data here about the importance of sourcing different resistance from around the world and that's what he does with his germplasm collections and this is just a neat little graph showing that uh, the South American material um, we've been sourcing for chocolate spot resistance uh, you can see really performs very poorly against the old and the new strain of Ascochyta. If you look at uh, the material we'd been bringing over from China that uh, was obviously very resistant, uh, had been selected for resistance against the old Ascochyta um, strain, it is, uh, it's, it's rubbish against the new one. So it's been, it's been compromised from that point of view. But thankfully, uh, material that we've been um, collecting from the Middle East and Mediterranean is uh, showing resistance to both the new and the old strain. And that just goes to show that probably uh, that sort of uh, genetic material had probably been selected naturally in the presence of both of these pathotypes. So um, we're really gaining and reaping benefits from uh, establishing a diversity in our genetic resistance. In lentils, very similar situation. Uh, the nipper resistance, as Jenny Davidson's reported previously, has been compromised. It's become established uh, in South Australia and Victoria. 
uh, it, is a, it is a breakdown in resistance and uh, however again the breeding, mat breeding program has, main, has several sources of resistance that's been using and, and so there's plenty of material that is, uh, re remains resistant. If you look at uh, uh, Nipper, if we, what we would uh, class as a typical Ascochyta isolate that Jenny's been doing in the growth room studies, you can see that it uh, uh, doesn't compromise Nipper. Um, the avirulent isolate collected from Nipper uh, also uh, is, it doesn't compromise it, whereas the virulent type uh, does. And this, uh, you can see that that compromise or that breakdown of resistance is the same pattern that we see in, um, in the field, both at uh, South Australia, the Malalas PBA site, as well as Horsham, uh, the PBA trial site there. So really the, the take home message there is that um, this uh, virulent shift is established in the field. It, um, the importance is to monitor, uh, thanks Gary, monitor, uh, I'm assuming, <laughs> I was wondering what you're doing there for, um, <laughs> uh, to, to really monitor Ascochyta, uh, um, uh, the, uh, the uh, Ascochyta establishment in the field, manage it uh, if it does get established early, but maybe also look at cultivar selection to uh, combat it. Okay, with this management of Ascochyta, Jenny's shown that uh, Ascochyta spore release is a very distinct pattern in that uh, May, early June period. Now what that means is because it is a very sharp, a distinct spike uh, in spore release, then if to protect the crop against that, the best practices uh, seems to be uh, seed dressings. And that's mainly because the window of um, seed dressings and the protection that it offers for roughly that six to eight week period is, uh, is going to get you through most of that sort of spore shower activity. So that is really the take home message there. It's not an absolute bullet bulletproof practice because we have seen that if you, uh, in, and as demonstrated in actually a number of pea crops last year, um, when, if you can, uh, through either seed dressing or in the case of field peas, sowing, sowing time, avoid those early sh spore showers. If you do sort of pick them up on the tail end, um, because they're polycyclic diseases, the rain fronts that uh, we, we saw all through uh, sort of June and, and July can still really perpetuate that disease. So it's very important to really uh, both um, uh, utilise all practices available to, to control the disease. Okay, just uh, quickly, um, I've got a SAGAT trial on looking at seed quality in faba bean and the agronomic practices that might affect seed quality. Uh, this was driven from the field mould incidents we had a few years ago. Um, it's, a, um, uh, it's done with a number of field survey type data as well as field trials, uh, thanks to the Saudi Crop Evaluation Group. And it links in with the, uh, the Pulse Agronomy Project on crop topping, which is one of the agronomic practices we look at. Really, the, um, the issues that uh, from preliminary data from the 2013 um, trials and surveys um, looking at uh, the seed quality, Variety uh, affected seed quality uh, the most. Uh, Fiesta was most at risk, so uh, that's probably an important point to take. If you, the improved seed quality attributes in the newer varieties uh, seem to work favourably at preventing a lot of diminished seed quality. Mechanical damage, uh, i.e. sort of wheel tracks from uh, running through the crop, had no significant effect on seed quality. Um, nor did windrowing um, in isolation, however, Windrowing, if you, the timing of windrowing, so late, late windrowing combined with a late harvest, late pickup, did compromise seed quality, and that's an important point that seems to have come out of the data. Uh, early crop topping also on one of the trials on the EP reduced seed quality, and the, the attributes that uh, the data showed was uh, shriveling, uh, weather stain, and ascochyta. And Ascochyta was a bit of a curious output there and uh, we think that probably what's happened is when you crop top a resistant variety, you essentially switch that resistance off, uh, but whereas on a susceptible variety it's really going to be the same. So uh, while it's not actively growing, you won't actually get that uh, genotypic resistance. Look, this is a, um, the data is still being analysed from 2014 and the trials will go in this year and so I'll keep you updated as to what's going on there. So just lastly, the potential issues of this year. The Green Bridge, uh, thanks to some summer rains that we've heard bandied about as far as impact on viruses, uh, they will also affect fungi. So if you're getting a lot of volunteers uh, that can perpetuate these uh, fungal diseases, then um, uh, you potentially will get some early establishment of disease. So it's really important to maintain, uh, to control that, to put yourself in a good position. 
uh, especially if we're going to have a warm, uh, wet autumn, uh, as, we, as we did uh, last year. So early fungicides or the seed dressings are critical. Uh, the ascochyta virulent shift, um, the important point there, is say particularly, as I mentioned with the, the faba beans, to really uh, keep uh, your, your new faba bean, PBA Samira, isolated away to maintain its purity uh, if you, to, for seed stocks for next subsequent years. Monitor your disease levels and, and really be vigilant if disease gets established, uh, particularly as we go through if we get a wet uh, spring. Mm -hmm.